Good evening, everyone. It's really, really special to be here. To be here with you, to be able to share this space with you, I think is very, very special. And this topic is something that is a very difficult topic. So the fact that you're brave enough to be here right now, I want you to congratulate yourself. This is a very brave topic. A lot of people heard about this topic and probably thought about being here, but decided not to be here. But you decided to be here. And that alone already deserves a huge congratulations. This time of year, before Yom Kippur, there's this idea of forgiveness. I have, over the years, given various versions of this talk. Tonight, I want to bring your attention to a couple of different ideas. The first is perhaps an idea or a prayer that is the most well-known two words of any prayer in all of Judaism. That is the prayer of Kol Nidre. Now, if you ask anyone what's the third word, what is the third word? Right? But the first two words are known very well. Kol Nidre. What, what is Kol Nidre? It means all the oaths. The most important prayer, or I'm not going to say the most important, the most attended prayer in any synagogue in the entire year is about absolving oaths. I want you to hold that thought for a second. And I want to back up. Tonight we're talking about forgiveness. Is there someone in your life who you need to forgive? I'll say it a little different. Is there someone in your life who could possibly get forgiveness from you? I want you to write that down. If you have a paper in front of you, write that person's name down. One person. I mean, if you want to write two, you can write two. But primarily one person. I want you to be able to visualize and that name as we're moving along tonight. And if you're done writing that name down, I want you to write one more name down. And this may be a harder name to write down. Is there a person in your life who you wish would forgive you? I want tonight's conversation to be very real. And every time I talk about forgiveness, I want you to think of one of these two people, either the person who you possibly could forgive if you would allow that to happen, which there may be good reasons why you're not forgiving them. And maybe even more important, the person who you wish would forgive you. So someone once had too much to drink at a party and he makes a complete fool of himself and passes out. His friends help his wife take him home and the next morning, he's very remorseful and he asks his wife, can you please forgive me? And she agrees to forgive and forget. I mean, maybe this story hits a little close to home for some of you, maybe it's happened to you, but... As the months go by, his wife referred to the incident from time to time, always with a, a note of ridicule or scorn in her voice. Finally, this guy is fed up of being reminded of his bad behavior. And he says, I thought you were going to forgive and forget. The wife looks at him and says, I have forgiven and forgotten. I don't want you to forget that I've forgiven and forgotten. I think that we've all been hurt 
in our lives. We weren't born yesterday, and there's been a point in time in our life that someone has offended us, that someone betrayed us, maybe someone mistreated us. Everyone has that someone or many or maybe a few someones. It's natural to cling to our resentments. Some people get like this strange satisfaction from clinging to their resentments. Maybe something happened to you when you were younger. Maybe someone wronged you. Maybe someone lied about you. Maybe someone cheated you. Maybe a good friend betrayed you. All of those are really good reasons to be angry. They're really good reasons to be bitter. My goal tonight is very simple. My goal is to encourage you and to maybe give you particular reasons and a process to choose to forgive. I'm going to be very open about what my goal is. I want you to choose to forgive. Now, there's a lot of different forms of forgiveness, and we'll talk about that a little later. But the idea, especially, this is a beautiful time. The Jewish calendar, I find, is such a powerful calendar because there's different times for different things. And in the year, you could pick a random Tuesday, December 3rd, and say, this is the day that I'm going to forgive. But in our calendar, this time, right now, today and tomorrow, and Saturday and Sunday before Yom Kippur, this is our time to forgive. Forgiveness does not require, again, this is my process of helping you choose to forgive. I want to give you a couple of rules. Forgiveness does not require that you approve of someone else's outrageous behavior. Forgiveness does not require for you to be abused again. Forgiveness does not require you to let that person back in your life. All it requires of you to do, according to Jewish law, is to let go of your resentment and your anger towards them. We believe that if you attempt to bury the hurt in your heart, it will seep out and it will contaminate your character. It will contaminate your behavior and probably your life. It'll probably take years off your life because of how much you hold in. True freedom begins when you can release the burden of your resentment. It's a burden. You're holding on to something that is hurting you more than it's hurting the other person. No one ever called me at three o'clock in the morning saying, stop thinking about me. But there's a lot of people at three o'clock in the morning that are thinking about other people. Harboring grudges poisons life in much the same way that any other toxin does. A, a few decades ago, Several American companies secretly buried toxic waste products underground. They filled these, these large metal containers with poisonous chemicals. They sealed the drums tightly and they buried them deep below the topsoil. And they thought, they honestly thought this was the end of it. What happened slowly is that many of the containers began to crack. And they began to leak this toxic waste. And all of a sudden, toxic waste started seeping to the surface. In some locations, it actually started killing off the vegetation and started ruining the water supply. People had to move out of their homes. 
And actually, one section near Niagara Falls, known as the Love Canal, people began dying of debilitating diseases, and no one knew why. What went wrong? What, what went wrong is that they tried to bury something that was too toxic. You get the metaphor? They thought they could be rid of it once and for all, but they didn't realize that the materials were so powerful that they were in fact too toxic for the containers to hold. They never dreamed that one day these contaminants would resurface and start killing people. Had they disposed of them properly, this terrible tragedy could have been avoided. I think the same is true with you and I. When someone hurts us, when someone does us wrong, instead of letting it go and trusting God to make it up to us, we bury it deep inside. We attempt to cram unforgiveness, to cram resentment, anger, destructive responses into our quote unquote airproof containers. We seal those lids tightly and then we say, good, I'm not gonna have to deal with that. I'll be passive aggressive about it. I'm not gonna have to think about it again, but it's gonna resurface just like that toxic waste, it's gonna resurface. And the things that you've crammed into your subconscious, the things that you've buried deep in your heart, they are going to rise to the surface and they're going to contaminate your life. We can't live with poison inside of us and not expect that eventually it's going to do us harm. You can't drink poison and think it's going to kill someone else. The best way I can describe this is with what I think is the saddest love story in the entire Bible. It's chapter six of the second book of Samuel. It describes what it should have been the happiest day in King David's life, the great King David, the warrior, the man who single-handedly brings peace to Israel. This should be the happiest day of his life and it definitely wasn't. He's united, just to give you context, he's united the northern and the southern tribes of Israel into a single nation. There's absolute unity amongst the Jewish people. This is going to be the beginning of the ancient Jewish empire. He's conquered Jerusalem. He made Jerusalem Israel's capital. He set down stones that you can touch if you go to Jerusalem today. The same stones that King David set down. And as a centerpiece of his efforts, he arranged to bring the famed, incredible Ark of the Covenant finally to its permanent home in Jerusalem. And there was going to be great celebration. But you see, many years before then, the Philistines had captured it. Its return would serve as the ultimate glorious symbol of the Jewish people's triumph. It would be a parade, the likes of which no one has ever seen before. The procession with the ark includes singing and dancing, and King David himself enthusiastically joins in the dancing with everyone else. David's wife, Michal, the daughter of his predecessor, King Saul, watches from the palace window and is disgusted by the spectacle of her husband dancing wildly in the streets. And when he comes in, all excited and exuberant and ecstatic, this the queen, Michal, she greets him with a little bit of sarcasm and says, well, Mr. King of Israel, <laughs> you're a real class act, jumping in public like a, a peasant street dancer. She's implying that she didn't grow up on a farm shooting coyotes with a slingshot like David. She grew up in the palace. 
She knows something about how kings are supposed to behave. And she says, you are undignified. You are an embarrassment. Kings are supposed to act like kings. And David, you're not a king today. David says that he's, when he writes this, that he's deeply hurt by her disapproval. And it spoils his entire day of celebration. And he strikes back at her where she's most vulnerable. By the way, husbands and wives know how to do this to each other. Because they know how to touch. They know how to, what I call, fight dirty. Fighting dirty is where you say, well, you always, uh, you, you know, you, oh, you think I'm bad. I'm going to win. By the way, just side note, if you win the argument, you lost the fight. Anyway, I digress. So he does the strike back where she's most vulnerable. She says, oh, yeah, well, I, King David says, I was dancing before God. But he's so hurt and so upset that he doesn't stop there. He continues saying, I was dancing before the God who rejected your father and made me king in his place. You know how? The chapter concludes, you ready for the next moment? It concludes with the most poignant words in the entire book of Samuel. The result of this conversation. I'll just read it to you in Hebrew, and then I'll translate it. Michal. <speaking in Hebrew> Saul's daughter never had a child to the day she died. Meaning, from that moment on, David and Michal were never husband and wife. That argument ended their marriage. They may have been married, but they were never intimate. A flip comment led to a permanent and bitter separation. I find that, and I've thought about this story quite a few times, I find that so sad. Here are two people who once loved each other so much that they risked their lives for each other. The stories about David and Michal are incredible to understand their absolute love. David fought one-on-one -on -one battles with Philistines to win Michal's hand in marriage. And when Michal's father, afraid that David would usurp, usurp the throne, which he did, when King Saul plots to kill him, she puts her life in jeopardy, helping David escape. So what happened to all that love? One argument? One set of angry words destroys all the love between Michal and David? What happened? What's the real story? That's not what happened. What destroyed their love was the fact that when David and Michal woke up the next morning, they didn't forgive each other. They could have had a conversation that was infused with empathy. They could have reconciled. Instead, they were both too proud. The resentment lingered and it contaminated their relationship. Resentment destroys love. Resentment destroys relationships. It spreads quietly and it destroys life. The Bible's point is as clear as today as it was thousands of years ago. If a husband or wife or two siblings or friends or anyone carries resentment, if they don't forgive each other, the love they have, no matter how deep it is, is unlikely to survive. No matter how deeply these two people once cared for each other, no love can survive resentment. The Hebrew word for forgiveness is mechila. M-E-C-H-I. 
I L A, Mechila. We say it over and over again in our Yom Kippur prayers. It's actually related to the word macho, M A C H O L, macho. You know what macho means? To dance in a circle. Now, what is the difference between a circle, you know, the Jewish dance, the horror dance, the circle that's formed in dance or in a Jewish dance, and forgiveness? We're all part of the circle of life. The Jewish dance that stretches across history, a brilliant, a, a vivid choreography. When I remain angry at a member of my family, think of that person you wrote down. When I remain angry at a person, a community person, if there's somebody, that person who you're thinking of right now, who I refuse to forgive, I push you out of the circle of belonging. When you remain angry at me, think of that other person that you may have written down. When you refuse to forgive me, you push me out of the circle. We're no longer dancing in unison. When we carry grudges, when we carry hate, when we carry negative energy, we can't dance. Think of it like circulation in the body. The heart circulates the blood through the body thousands of times each day. It's transporting oxygen and, and, and nutrients that are vital for health. But what happens when there's a clot? Heaven forbid. What happens when the blood is not allowed to dance through the body? God, God is the heart of the people. Every single one of us is a limb. When I block you out, I create a clot and the dance is diminished. The movement of our dance is compromised. Everyone has a blessing to give. We're going to forfeit our grace and our energy by leaving someone out of the circle. When I grant you forgiveness, what I'm doing is I'm joining in a dance of reconnection. When I let go of ill feelings, when I let go of anger, the obstacle to the flow of the circle is removed. And then once again, we can dance together. This Sunday night will be Yom Kippur, the day of Mechila, the day of forgiveness. It's a time to dance, to dance with each other and to dance with God. So I wish, my wish to you is that you have the courage to forgive the people who have hurt you, to forgive the spouse who did you wrong, to forgive the friend who betrayed you, to forgive the parent who mistreated you when you were younger, to get rid of all that poison. The best time to do it is today. To not let the bitterness continue to contaminate your life. It's time to dance. So, I know that for many of us, it's not easy to let go. I know that it's really, and I want to acknowledge this, it's very hard to let go of a grievance. It's very hard to forgive. So, this is all wonderful. And you're saying, Rabbi, this is great in a perfect world, but how do we forgive? How do we actually let go of the hurt? How do we actually let go of the anger? I've thought about this really long and hard. And what I'd like to present tonight is five strategies. And if you have your pen and paper or your writing, this is a good time to, to, to write. Five strategies that I personally have found really helpful. I have changed these five strategies, I would say maybe four or five, maybe six times now. And I think this is a good recipe for 
letting go of the hurt and letting go of the anger and allowing the resentment to melt away. Here's number one. Number one. I want you to start off by first envisioning the person who troubled you, who offended you. Do you have the name in your mind? Do you have it? Okay. I want you to reflect right now on the troubled life of the person who offended you. Imagine your way into their experience, into their perspective. Just wear their shoes for a minute and walk a mile. That way you're a mile away and you have their shoes. Just wear their shoes for a minute. Consider their psychological problems. Consider the abuse they may have experienced. Maybe the addiction they suffer from. And ask yourself, have any of those factors contributed to the evil they did to you? We're not justifying here. I'm just asking the question. Don't, don't get me wrong. We're not justifying anything. We're not answering anything. We're just asking the question. They don't exonerate their behavior. But what it does is it allows you to think about them with empathy. It makes it easier for you to forgive them. Understanding their experience and understanding their perspective, understanding their issues can be a catalyst for forgiveness. That's number one. Just empathize. It's very hard, but just, I'm sure if the person did something to you and you're holding on to it, you know them very well. And if you know them very well, you could probably answer these questions. And my guess is they're probably yes to a lot of them as far as their past and the troubles of their past. What I want you to do is just allow yourself to empathize with them for a minute, just for a minute. Number two, you got number one? Number one, reflect on the troubled life of the person who offended you. Number two, consider the whole person rather than fixating on the bad behavior. Remember the kindnesses that they may have done for you. It's very easy to forget that. If you're remembering the mistakes they made, you have to remember the good they did as well let's say, for example, two, two best friends get into a fight. And in the heat of the moment, one deeply insulted the other. The one who receives the insult said nothing. But they wrote in the sand, today, my best friends hurt me terribly. Days later, the man had, who had been hurt was pinned under a fallen horse. His friend pulled him out and sped him to a doctor. This time, the injured man carved into stone. Today, my best friend saved my life. I think that's a wise way to handle an insult. Record it lightly. Why I say sand? Because the winds of forgiveness can erase it. That's why I say sand. But the kindnesses we receive, the kindnesses we receive, they engrave them permanently. They recall them often. Focus on the whole person. This is going to help you forgive them. Number one. Number one, reflect on the troubled life of the person who offended you. Number two, consider the whole person, not just the bad behavior. You ready for number three? Number three, think about any unintended good that resulted from the wrong done to you. 
when others hurt us, it often pushes us to grow in ways that we wouldn't have otherwise. As hard, as hard as it is to see this, sometimes pain can be for the best. Sometimes obstacles make us stronger. Sometimes defeats can prepare the way for, for future victories. So if you find it tough to forgive someone, especially someone who's asked for forgiveness, see whether you can find any personal growth or other good that resulted because of what happened. And on the basis of that, you can find it in your heart to forgive the person who hurt you. Your strength and the unintended good can be the basis for forgiveness. So number one, reflect on the troubled life. Number two, consider the whole person. Number three, think of any unintended good. Number four, I'm going to give a caveat to number four. Number four only works if you believe in God. If you don't believe in God, just ignore this one. When a person who hurt you asks you for forgiveness and gives you the confidence that they're not going to repeat their bad behavior in the future, you should accept their apology and offer them a wholehearted forgiveness. Why? Because people have the ability to change. You are not the same person that you were 10 years ago. You're a different person. They also are a different person. They also have the ability to change, to improve, to grow. To ignore the possibility that people can change is the essence of atheism. Human beings are made in God's image. So to denigrate people and deny their ability to change is to denigrate and deny God. So if you're an atheist, don't forgive. You're going to hell anyway. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but if you're a believer, try to forgive. We owe the offender the opportunity to demonstrate that they are a different person today than they were last month or last year. And I'll add this, it matters to God how we treat one another because we all bear his image. We're all precious. Only God can forgive those who forgive others. So, number one, reflect on the troubled life. Number two, consider the whole person. Number three, consider the unintended good. And number four, consider that they have the ability to change. People can change. Now, number five. What is number five? This strategy of number five, I'll say, is morally courageous. It's not always applicable, but I'll share it because I love it and I love it the most. In, in the 11th century, there was a great scholar. His name was Rabbi Shmuel Hanagid. Shmuel was the prime minister to the king of Spain. The king of Spain held him in high regard. He was among the nobles, and many of the other nobles were jealous the king had appointed a Jew to high office. Sound familiar? So they kept trying to besmirch him. One day, the king went with this Shmuel Hanagid to tour the city. And as they're walking, a shopkeeper stormed out of his store and started shouting humiliating insults at, at Rabbi Shmuel. He, Shmuel pays no attention to the nasty language. But the king was enraged. 
Remember, this is a barbaric age. This is not uh, a nice time. So he says to Shmuel, arrest that man and cut out his vile tongue. Rabbi Shmuel inquired about the man and found that he was impoverished and he couldn't support his family. So what did he decide to do? He decided to send the man money in regular installments every month. Sometime later, the king and Rabbi Shmuel were out in the city again, and they came across the same man. The man runs out of his shop, starts praising Rabbi Shmuel. The king looks at him and says, didn't I tell you to have that man's tongue cut out? Rabbi Shmuel smiles and he says, I did exactly as you said, your majesty. I removed his vile tongue and I replaced it with a noble one. I love that story. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful way to respond to those who hurt us. Maybe they hurt us because they're asking for our help. Our resentment over the offender's sin will melt away by replacing it for our love for them. So, we have five strategies. Number one, reflect on a troubled life of the offender. Number two, focus not just on their evil, but also on their kindness, on the whole person. Number three, consider the unintended good that resulted. Number four, remember that a person has the ability to change. And finally, my favorite, consider cutting out their vile tongue and replacing it with a noble one. Letting go of the hurt by helping the offender. Now, a lot of people asked before this, what about myself? I think all of these five things as they apply for someone else, they apply for you. Let's just do it again. Think of now, think of yourself. If you have to forgive yourself. Reflect on the troubled life of the offender. Should I say more about that? Right? Focus not only on your evil, but also on your kindness. Consider the unintended good that's resulted as a result of not forgiving yourself. Remember that you have the ability to change and let go of the hurt by helping yourself. So you think it's only about someone else? Exactly the same thing can be applied to yourself. Now, I hope these five strategies work for you. Forgiving, however hard it is, the reason why we need to do it is because that's what God does for us. If you want God to forgive you, how can God forgive someone who doesn't know how to forgive? Forgive because schlepping resentments is like getting up every morning and filling a big wheelbarrow full of old garbage and bringing it into the new day. Tonight, I urge you, it's a perfect time. This is the time on the Jewish calendar that we can let go. Now is it. Let it go. Forgiving that person doesn't mean that you have to call them up and ask for forgiveness. Because sometimes... Like we said earlier, re-employing the relationship, opening up that door may not be good because maybe that person is a narcissist or that person doesn't have the ability to have boundaries. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean that you have to talk to them and forgive them. It means you need to forgive them. They don't have to know about it. 
maybe part of the forgiveness is you don't want to give them the joy of knowing that you forgave them. It's part of that. But you can still forgive them. Forgive them means you left it. It's done. You have thrown the garbage. You took the wheelbarrow with all the garbage and you threw it out. It's garbage day. And there's a lot. And maybe you have to call one of those companies that comes in and gets rid of the junk. And you have to point to it. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. That's what they always say. All you have to do is point and we'll get rid of it. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you may have seen the southern gate to the old city. It's one of the closest to the to the Kotel. To, to the Wailing Wall. It's known as the Lion's Gate. It actually, before it was called the Lion's Gate, it had a another name. It was called Shar Ha'ashpat, which means the Dung Gate, or the Gate of Dirt. The reason that that gate had that funny name for centuries is because Jewish pilgrims would come to Jerusalem from around the world to pray at the Kotel. They came on foot across the desert. And by the time they reached the gates of the city, their feet were covered in mud and dirt. They didn't want to defile the temple by entering the city in that condition. So they washed all the mud and filth off of their feet at the southern gate. That's where they would wash the filth. And it became known as the gate where you wash off the dirt. I think about that date, that gate so much. Actually, every time I go to Jerusalem, I end up going purposefully to the Kotel to pray through that gate. And you know what I do? I stop at the gate and I wash off all my dirt emotionally, psychologically, just wash it all off. Because that's where we always washed off our dirt. So today... We're not going through the sands and the mud. Today, we, we carry a lot of other dirt with us. And so I always make sure to stop there and to meditate at the gate and wash off all my dirt. I think today, we stand at the gate leading to the new year. We want to, it's done. Five, seven, eight, four. Let's enter it clean. Let's enter it pure. We want God to forgive us. And we know how much we need to be forgiven for. So in order for God to forgive us, we have to forgive others. I've always wondered, and I started off with this question tonight. I've always wondered about that prayer, the prayer of Kol Nidre. Why is Kol Nidre about absolving oaths the most prayed prayer of the entire year. I could think of so many other prayers that would deserve the amount of PR that Kol Nidre gets. I mean, some of the cantors do a beautiful job, but at the end of the day, I don't know if you've ever read it. I've read it. It's just about absolving oaths. There's a lot of stories about why Kol Nidre is, is there and I'm, this is not what tonight is about. One of the many stories is that Kol Nidre was written by the Muranos. In the times of the, the Crusaders, a lot of people were forced, unfortunately, Jews were forced to convert to another religion or die at the stake. And so they would not, by their own will, just to stay alive, they would openly convert, but secretly they would hide that they were really Jewish. And once a year, they would come together and they would cry Kol Nidre, saying that the oath that we made is not real. God, we're really yours. We're really, we're really, we're really here. And I think about those people who had to hide their Judaism just to stay alive and what Kol Nidre meant to them. And that alone is just so soul stirring. But I think it has another message. One of the things that we do, one of the most powerful prayers is besides for the Kol Nidre, which is collective, we also have Hatarat Nedarim, which is 
this absolving of oaths. We actually do it by standing up in front of three people and reciting it, and they recite something back to us. It's an incredible prayer. If you've never done it before, it's a real, really amazing experience where, and, and one of the things that, it, that we say in that prayer is just as we, saying the three people, which form a baked din, a Jewish court, just as we forgive you below, so God will forgive you above. It all, we also say in that prayer that there are times that we do things in chazaka, which means we do it three times. Doing something in routine is an oath, but then we break that routine. And every time we break that routine, we break an oath. I think that kol nidre is really a message to our souls. So many of us live feeling that we don't live up to our standard, that we're breaking an oath. The oath, I thought I could have been better. I could have done better. I could have responded better. I could have answered. And we, we, we constantly hit ourselves and slap ourselves and we're tough on ourselves. Our, the worst critic in the world is me. I'm the worst critic of myself. And we're constantly, constantly berating ourselves. I think Kol Nidre is there to say to us, absolve yourself. You're okay. I know this year you didn't live up to your expectation. I know this year you didn't do everything you wanted to do. Absolve yourself. It's okay. All the oaths, all the expectations, everything you wanted to do, guess what, my friends? It's a new year. Don't be so hard on yourself. And if someone else that's close to you is hard on themselves, you smile and you give them a hug and you say, it's okay. I'm here for you. I love you just the way you are. Don't worry. It'll be okay. It's a new year. Let's start over. Let's take the garbage. Let's throw it out. Let's start over. My wish to you, my prayer to each and every one of you, the fact that you're still here with me, you're still following this and listening to this and, and being here just to this, this monologue that I've just been talking and talking, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet soon and listen to you soon. My prayer and my blessing and my wish is that God should wash off all the resentments, all the grudges, all the lingering anger that each of us have. And as those grudges and those resentments, and that anger, as it melts away, may we dance through the Dunga Gate, the gate of dirt, as one people. May we be able to have the confidence, the love to love ourselves, the, the strength to love others and the ability to let it go. And when we let it go, God will let it go. And together with our relationship, us, me, you, and God, we're going to be enter a, a new year. And we say the Shana Tova Umituka, that it should be sweet. We say sweet because if we said happy, Maybe you have a different version of happy than I do, but everyone knows what sweet is. And may it truly, truly be sweet for each and every one of us.